Hello and welcome to our Intro to Cassandra for Developers Learning series. This is video one of seven, Cassandra Fundamentals. In this video, you'll get a high-level tour of what Cassandra is and why so many leading companies and disruptive technologies have adopted it over the last decade. So let's start with what Cassandra is. It is a NoSQL distributed database. We'll focus on the distributed part here in a moment. Each instance of Cassandra is called a node, and this contains a full Cassandra database. Each node can handle roughly two to four terabytes of data and many thousands of operations a second per core. You might notice that we haven't given an exact number because this really depends on the resources allocated to a single node. In general though, we're talking thousands of operations a second per core. Now I mentioned a moment ago that Cassandra is a distributed database. While you could technically run it on a single node, it would kind of defeat the purpose of what it's meant to do. It is also a leaderless peer-to-peer -peer system meaning any node can do what any other node can. We'll explore more what this means a little bit later. Nodes communicate through a protocol called gossip, and they use this to transmit information to one another, an example being the status of a node. Then finally, nodes are organized into groups called data centers. Notice the ring connecting all of the nodes. So in this case, we could say all of these nodes belong to the same data center. And later on, I'll show you how data centers can really increase the flexibility of what you can do with Cassandra. Okay, so that was just a high-level overview of some cluster basics. There are some other things you should know about Cassandra. One, this is a petabyte-level database. Just think about how much data that is. That is a 1 followed by 15 zeros. It's one thing to be able to store that amount of data, but it's another entirely to do so while maintaining performance at scale, something that Cassandra excels at. It is also called the always-on database because it is purpose-built to maintain 100% uptime even in cases of node failure. It does this through its distributed nature, automatic replication, and leaderless topology. Remember the data centers I talked about earlier? Geographical distribution is one way you can use them to create a global database. Put your data centers where you need them around the world, and Cassandra will handle communication and replicating your data automatically. One of the best known features of Cassandra is its performance at scale. Generally speaking, writes happen at the speed of wire from micro to tight milliseconds, while reads are usually within milliseconds. This holds true whether your database has three nodes or thousands of nodes. Cassandra scales linearly and can scale indefinitely. If you need more performance, add more nodes. And finally, it's completely vendor agnostic. You can install it anywhere, no vendor lock-in. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, if Cassandra is a distributed database and I have some set of data, how does it know where to put data or how to get it later if I want to read it? So data in Cassandra is divided up into what are called partitions. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later uh, in video three of seven, tables, partitions, and examples. But for now, take a look at the example table to the right. Notice we have three columns, country, city, and population. Country is our partition key in this case. What we are saying is that we are dividing up our rows based on the country value. Notice there are multiple rows with the country USA, France, Canada, and Germany. Since these have the same partition key, they will be stored together within a node and data will automatically be distributed around the nodes in the cluster. Let's take a look at an example. Here we've taken the data from our table and distributed it around our cluster based on the partition key. Notice how the rows with the same country value are grouped together. These are literally stored within the same physical partition on disk. This means later on, if I wanted to know the population for every city in the United States, I could read a single partition and get my results with very low IO cost. Again, you choose the partition key for your table, and Cassandra will handle all the rest. It does all of the data distribution for you. Now looking at this picture, some of you might be thinking, what happens if I lose the node that contains the USA partition up top? Do I lose my data? Let's see how replication works to answer that question. The first thing I'd like you to notice is that each node has a number assigned to it. The numbers listed here are arbitrary to keep things simple, but the idea still applies. These are called partition tokens, and every node is assigned a set of tokens they own. So starting at the top, node labeled zero, 
that node owns tokens 84 through 0. Then the next node owns 1 through 17, and so on around the ring. If you remember recently, we spoke about partition keys. Well, when you add a partition key to a table, that value is automatically hashed out to a token value. That is how Cassandra knows where to store and retrieve your data, the partition key. Think of the partition key as the address of your data. Now, how does this apply to what happens if we lose a node, like in the previous example of the USA partition? Cassandra wouldn't be a very robust database if it only had stored one copy of a partition in one place. If that were the case, it wouldn't take much before a single failure could mean missing data or a failed operation. And this is where replication factor comes into play. In the example you see now, notice there is a single ring. We are denoting a replication factor of one, which in our USA partition example means one copy of that partition on one node. However, I can increase to a replication factor of two. Notice what happened. Now I have two rings and two nodes will now contain the USA partition. If I increase one more time to a replication factor of three, now I add another ring and I have three copies of the USA partition on three different nodes. A replication factor of three is the standard in Cassandra as it gives a solid balance between availability, performance, and consistency. Okay, so I said we would come back to explaining how data is stored and retrieved in Cassandra. Starting with a replication factor of three, Imagine we'd like to write some data, maybe our USA partition from earlier. As the request comes in, any node is chosen to handle the request. This is what we call the coordinator node. To be clear, any node can be a coordinator. It is simply the name given to the node that handles the request. And to repeat, in Cassandra, any node can do what any other node can, which means that all of the nodes in the ring can handle this operation. Let's move on. So the 59 you see there is just the partition token that was hashed out of the partition key for the data we are writing. Again, this is just an arbitrary number for illustration. We can imagine this is the token value for our USA partition. Now in the case of a replication factor of three, there are three nodes that own the token range that contains 59 in this case. The nodes labeled 67, 83, and zero in the diagram. So what happens is the coordinator forwards the write to all three nodes, and each node stores a copy. So what happens if a node is down during this process? Cassandra stores what is called a hint. Once it comes back up, the write is automatically played back to heal the node. And this is one of the many robustness features that's built into the core of Cassandra. All right, so let's take a look at consistency level. Again, I'm not going to go over all the possible scenarios here, just the standard way to do things based off the best balance for performance, availability, and consistency. There are plenty of other options that you can sink your teeth into if you want, uh, but those are more advanced topics. Look at the picture you see now. There are a couple things going on here, so let's explain what you are seeing. First thing, we are using our default of a replication factor of three, meaning any write will be stored on three nodes. In this case, we are also using a consistency level of quorum, which translates into a majority of nodes. So in the case of a replication factor of three, a majority is two nodes. This means that with a replication factor of three using quorum, Cassandra will wait for an acknowledgement from two nodes before saying the write is okay and sending the result back to the client. If consistency level cannot be reached for an operation, the operation will fail. Moving on to a read operation, Again, using a consistency level of quorum, we see the client makes a request, the coordinator reads from two nodes, and the result is sent back to the client. Now you may be asking, wait, does it matter which two nodes or what happens if one of the nodes has stale data for some reason? This is where some of the really awesome capability of Cassandra comes into play. No, it doesn't matter. If I set my consistency level to read a quorum, it can choose any two of the three nodes that might have data. This means I could even have one node offline and still be able to handle this request. Also, if one node is stale for some reason, Cassandra will automatically repair the data and send the correct result back to the client. By the way, using this combination of write a quorum and read a quorum is what we call immediate consistency. Immediate here means I can immediately read what I just wrote anywhere in my cluster. This is the standard and balances performance, availability, and consistency, as I mentioned before. And this is where you should start, by the way. Anything else is something you should really look into and understand before doing so. 
Now starting to bring this all together, remember way back at the beginning of this video, I mentioned how data centers can increase the flexibility of what you can do with your Cassandra database. Here are some examples. In the example on the left, we have a single global database that is spread across three data centers in different regions of the world. If I were to write some data to any node in the data center located in the Americas, that data would automatically get replicated over to the data centers in the EMEA and APAC regions, all at the speed of wire. No ETL or manual file copy is needed. I could then read that data, say in Australia, right away. If you think about the implications of this, it means I can put data where my users are with the lowest amount of response time and use the inherent replication in Cassandra to move data where it needs to go. When it comes down to it, no system can currently beat the speed of light. If you want your users to have acceptable response times and come back to your app, you need to put their data as close to them as possible. Cassandra makes this second nature. Now moving on to the right, we see that Cassandra works with any of the major cloud providers along with on-premise installations. And really, we're talking all cloud providers, not just the major ones. Cassandra is completely vendor agnostic. There is no vendor lock-in. You can install it anywhere. And again, going back to the flexibility of data centers, you can operate a single Cassandra database in hybrid cloud or multi-cloud configurations. So whether you are talking from on-premise along with a cloud provider or any combination of all of the above, it does this right out of the box. And finally, Cassandra fits a pretty wide range of use cases, whether that's scalability where high throughput and high volume applications are needed, mission critical cases where you need to ensure the database will be available in case of outages, globally distributed to get data close to users and handle different security requirements around the globe, or able to deploy across any cloud platform or on-prem. If any of these apply, Cassandra is probably a solid fit. Okay, so you just absorbed a lot of information. And if you want to dig a little deeper, then check out our Cassandra Fundamentals course up on Katakoda. This is all free and will give you a hands-on experience all up in the cloud. So even if you have a lower resource machine or bandwidth, you can still experience Cassandra directly and get your hands dirty. The link is in the video details. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and I really appreciate your attention. Next, move on to video two of seven in this series and we'll see you again here real soon.